Welcome to The Lover's Hole, where we're rereading the Aubrey Matron novels of Patrick O'Brien. As usual, you're with Mike. And with Ian. And we're on part three of the Ionian mission. Ian, what happened last time and what might we look forward to this week? Well, Mike, last time Jack and Stephen had made it to sea aboard the Worcester, their less than plumb, less than desirable ship of the line. They've been putting together the ship's company and we've had a little bit of a window into how they processed new hands fresh from the press. We saw one of them being given a bit of a humane reprieve by Dr. Maturin. And we saw the new wardroom establish itself with Pullings as first lieutenant. He's got Moat there, but he's also got this slightly grumpy, slightly privileged snob Lieutenant Summers. And we kind of wonder what's going to happen to Lieutenant Summers. Stephen, meanwhile, made a bit of a ham-fisted attempt at humour with Professor Graham, the philosopher. That seems to have backfired and he's kind of spoiled his potentially uh, interesting new professional relationship with Graham. Jack, meanwhile, is still not firing on all cylinders. He's kind of at a bit of a low ebb as a, as a, as a man, as a husband, and as a sea captain. Not firing all cylinders is particularly relevant because the cylinders last week were charged with psychedelic coloured gunpowder from a firework merchant bought on the cheap. To cap all of this, Jack's first encounter with the French was a bit of a botched affair. It could have been great, but instead of Jack's usual decision making and dash, we got disappointment. And to cap the capping, as it were, Stephen has copped it. Stephen, on deck during the beginnings of this action, sustained a very Jack Aubrey like set of wounds, shrapnel wounds, um, and lying below convalescing, he had to tolerate the worthy but boring visits of a boatload of talkative parsons. So that was last time. Mike, this week, what are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to being past Gibraltar. We're off Toulon already on the Mediterranean coast of France. Jack is renewing his acquaintance with a couple of admirals. Stephen is trying to get along better with the Worcester's guests, and he's going to try and build a bit of a rapport with the parson, Mr. Martin. Um, We're going to meet an old friend of ours, Henry H. Dundas, and we're going to begin to learn a bit about the complex web of politics and intelligence in the Mediterranean, especially the Eastern Med. We've got the interests of Britain and France and the Ottoman Empire deeply entangled, and maybe Maturin is there to do some untangling. Excellent. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, this is really shaping up to be a fascinating book here. And as as we rejoin our heroes this week, Jack is heading aboard the flagship Ocean. He's got his best uniform on, you know, going to meet Admiral Thornton, the commander in chief, you know, the man who is heading the Mediterranean in this blockading squadron. Jack knows him from early in his career as an outstanding seaman, somebody who demands a high degree of competence in his captains. And Jack realizes that he really can't distinguish himself on the Toulon blockade what he calls this parenthesis in his career, but he could, in his words, take a fall. You know, the Admiral has sent many men back on the beach forever. And Admiral Hart, the second in command here, as we well know, does not love Jack and would love to find a good reason Mm -mm. for him. Yeah. Now, Jack's got his ship up and running. He's pretty much turned things over to Tom Pullings. And with the spare time on his hands, he finds himself worrying more and more about his legal troubles back home. O'Brien tells us that only the great gun exercise and his evenings with Stephen, Scarlatti, Oldbuck, and Mozart take his mind off the care that's followed him. Yeah, there's an old maxim in, Mm. in ships and sailing that you can't outrun worry. And Jack certainly is feeling that one strongly now. He is. And I think that feeling's intensified as we meet Admiral Thornton, the commander-in-chief. Jack, I think, has got some previous connections, certainly some previous acquaintance with Thornton, who's really highly regarded as a very capable commander. And he's been in charge of the Mediterranean car for a long time now. And we get this description of Admiral Thornton as a pale, bold, bloated ghost of the man that Jack had known. Thornton's known as a great fighting captain, a great organizer, a great disciplinarian, not a flogger, keen on religious observ- observance, and happily married. So quite, you know, quite the upstanding figure. But we see Thornton through Jack's eyes as Jack calls aboard the flagship. The Admiral's dealing with paperwork. 
his old pug dog Tabitha comes over. Jack gets bitten in the leg by this rather snappy, grumpy old dog for his trouble. The Admiral stays seated. We get this picture, I think, Mike, of a, an Admiral that's not in the prime of physical health. Stays seated, shakes Jack's hand and says, oh, falls back into his chair. He's happy to have a real seaman in the squadron, he says, of Jack. And points out, by the way, that Jack's been sensible in his setting up of the masts of the Worcester and and not some heavy sparred ship that uh, that might struggle through the winter blockade. So Thornton's already looking ahead to hard lying and hard service for the Worcester. Yeah, I think it's not at all the the man that Jack expected to see. He's got some nice words for Jack. We're a little worried here, but then Jack, before the Admiral starts, says, I- I've got something for you here. And he delivers a package of letters from the Admiral's wife and daughters. Jack had made it a point to go visit them before he set sail. Now, the you know, complete change comes over the Admiral. He's delighted. Yeah. He's so grateful. O'Brien tells us that the light goes back on in his eyes. This time, he pushes himself up from his chair, shakes Jack's hand properly, notices the blood on Jack's stockings and apologizes for his dog bite. (laughs) He tells Jack, she grows fractious with old age like her master, I'm afraid, and she pines to run on shore. Do you know, Aubrey, it is 13 months since I let go an anchor. Now, he assures Jack that Tabitha or Tabby. I think it's kind of like my mom. It's, you know, Mike, when everything's going well, Michael, (laughs) I've I've been misbehaving. Uh, That Tabby isn't mad, no rabies, uh, because he's assured her she's bitten all the flag officers, bitten Hart, Admiral Hart, many times, and none of them have had any ill (laughs) effects. But then the Admiral makes an interesting point here. He says, a good set to with the French would set us both up, meaning him and the dog. Make us young again and let us go home at last. Ah, now this has certainly caught Jack's interest here. He asks if there's any chance that the French will come out. And the animal says, you know, it's not likely in the current weather, but there's been a lot more activity in recent weeks. So he's hopeful and kind of almost in passing. He tells Jack at the end of their visit that there's a court martial tomorrow, a court martial at sea, a little bit unusual rather than waiting to to do it on shore. And there's one that the Admiral says is a particularly ugly case that he does not want to be heard in Malta. So he wants to dispense with that out here before they get back to Malta. Um, He tells Jack to attend the court martial to be there and to send over Dr. Maturin at noon to meet with himself, the admiral, and the physician of the fleet. So, Mike, we, we get to the end of the chapter, and very cleverly, this interaction with Thornton has set up a lot of interesting things for us to speculate about. We get the idea that the French could be coming out. We get the foreshadowing of this court-martial and this, you know, the, the idea that there's something ugly that we're going to find out about when it, when it emerges. This idea of... <laughs> Jack potentially taking a fall as he's out here running away from his problems at home. The the fact that Admiral Hart is on the same station is a bit of jeopardy there for Jack. And I think we're going to come back a couple of times again to the idea of age and how Thornton himself is aging. And I think there are some really clear parallels that we're going to be invited to draw between Thornton in the autumnal years of his career and Jack, who's maybe starting to put the years on himself. Nicely spotted. Yeah, absolutely. So we open chapter four and Jack is having dinner aboard another ship with his old friend, Hennage Dundas. This time, Hennage is captain of the excellent. You'll recall that Jack and the two of them have been friends since their midshipman days, their lieutenant days together. And Jack starts by saying that he was just really shocked to see the Admiral. And it says that, you know, when he came out here, which was months ago, you know, he was too. He hadn't seen him in some time. He's heard he's getting worse. He's only on deck half hour a day. He never entertains. And Jack asks, what's wrong with him? And Hennish describes the you know, the toll that it takes of keeping up this strict blockade with, he describes, a worn out squadron, some damned, awkward and troublesome captains and an incompetent second in command. I think no love lost for Hart here, Admiral Hart, by any Mm -mm. means. Yeah. And it it says, you know, I think, and it's just starting to tell him, 
these are on top of the usual hardships of a blockade being cut off, foul weather, people are bored and harassed, the ships, you know, really feeling like prison. Um, and it says that he's been feeling this and he's only been there for three months, but the admiral's been doing it for years and many more years than any prior commander in chief. And Jack asks, you know, why doesn't he just go home? And he says, well, because there's nobody to take over. And and Jack mentions a number of potential candidates, all good seamen, and doesn't, you know, just doesn't understand. He doesn't. And by the way, it's fascinating that we're getting all this exposition and analysis of what's going on. Still not in the point of view of Jack Aubrey. We've had the Admiral himself. We've had quite a lot of conversations with Stephen and other people around the ship. We've had Hennage, but we, we, we're we getting all of this without Jack Aubrey's voice and his point of view in it, which I think is keeping on kind of confirming to us that Jack's not, not his resourceful, usual self. Anyhow, Hennage points out that it's not just the blockade, that the Admiral could do the blockading part with one hand tied behind his back. It's not just a matter of seamanship. He goes on to say, it's the French. He says, the whole Mediterranean and everything that touches it, Catalonia, Italy, Sicily, the Adriatic, the Ionian, the Turks, Egypt, the Barbary states. He's pretty much just given the the kind of clockwise tour of the Eastern Med from the Adriatic round to the Atlantic coast. Lots of which in this stage of history, commanded by the Ottoman Empire. And Hennage describes his personal experience dealing with the Barbary states, that's the, the, the North African Ottoman states like Algeria, on behalf of the Admiral. He was sent to reason with the day, the local official, and though he'd done well, despite some internal interference from the English advisors, he returned a few weeks later only to find the day murdered, a new day demanding, day, D-E-Y, a new day demanding fresh presence and a new agreement with the king. And the Foreign Office wants to interfere. He says there are government civilians and the army all meddling in the area assigned to Admiral Thornton, making everything more complicated. And by the way, I think it was pretty broadly understood that the affairs of the Ottoman Empire were run in you know, with arcane political complexity, Mike. You know, when we say something is of Byzantine complexity, that's what we're talking about. Well put. So many of these countries are playing both sides. There's a real lack of trust. It's this whole thing that the Admiral is managing is described as being a whole cat's cradle of strings in his hands and constant visits from all of these different outposts and sources of intelligence. Thornton is running this primarily on his own, going months without fresh orders from the Admiralty, without fresh intelligence from London. He's basically in command with no one who's of the calibre to replace him. And apparently, the Admiral's wife had told Jack that he, the Admiral, had asked to be relieved several times, but we hear that the Admiral could have insisted on being relieved, but had always left a bit of an out, had always left a loophole so that he wasn't really giving an ultimatum and that they could ask him to continue and not be replaced. And Hennage thinks that Thornton is really longing to go home, but longs more, I think, for that to come only after a fleet action and victory over the French. So everybody in this book seems to be longing for action. We've heard it from Tom Pullings (laughs) and we're hearing it from Admiral Thornton. I, I think we can assume that that's a longing in Jack's heart as well, although he hasn't talked about it very directly yet. Hennage's wrapping up remark is he says, the Admiral will either have his battle or die aboard his ship, which is a pretty grim way. Ouch. <laughs> pretty grim way to reflect on the end of anybody's career. Right. And in closing, just to reinforce the sort of set the downbeat tone, Hennage closes out by telling Jack how lucky Jack is to have Stephen. And I think Jack knows this already. Right. You know, and, and it's interesting, you know, and he's just saying, you know, he just, he doesn't have anybody that he can talk to. He's glad Jack's there because he can talk to Jack, but you know, Jack at least has Stephen on board his ship in the midst of this blockade. And in the midst of, you know, what we've always heard Jack talking about, it's, you know, it's pretty lonely at the top here. And to your point yeah. earlier, it, I think it's, you know, it's so nice to see Hennage who's delivering this exposition We've got this old friend of Jack's, probably, as you've said before, the only person apart from Sophie and Stephen who's ever tried to offer him criticism from a friend's perspective. Um, he's always been an influence for the good. So it's, it's you know, we're glad to see Hennage uh, sitting down with Jack here and to know that he's got this ear just uh, right across the water, you know, a, a ship or two away. And I think that also gives us a little sign that maybe one day soon all will be okay with Jack. 
Yes. The fact that it's Hennage, he's al- he's always been around at key moments for Jack to get on and redeem himself. So I think that's a positive sign. Right. Now, I think Stephen had hoped to visit Hennage himself, but he's getting ready to go and attend the Admiral to spend time with the physician of the fleet. And he, he has another go, I think, Mike, at showing off his nautical knowledge chops. Um, he botched it, I think, when he was trying to show off to the, to Professor Graham and ended up making a bit of a low-key enemy out of Graham. But he manages to do a bit more of a uh, a human job, I think, of sharing his knowledge with Martin. He talks about the order of the command. He talks about the different flags that the admirals and their ships fly. And he points out the Union Jack on the admiral's ship that signifies the court-martial. And uh, he invites Martin to come along aboard the flagship so Stephen and Martin together can understand a little bit about what's going on and what these court martials are all about. Yeah, they're they're waiting for Jack to get there, you know, to kind of come up so they can get in the boat and go over to the court martial. And Martin has been watching this young Mr. Calamy, you know, this widow's son that Jack has has taken on board with him. And Stephen is explaining yeah. why this this puny young man is every day struggling to carry this calf across the deck. So Stephen's telling him that these wicked older midshipmen told him that they carries it every day. As the calf grows, Calamy will become huge and powerful and ultimately able to lift the grown cow. He'll become, Stephen says, a second Milo of Cretonia. And, uh, you know, this was, a, mm. you know, another one of Stephen's obscure references for me here who he but apparently a six-time olympic victor you know probably the most famous wrestler in greek antiquity back in the you know for about 20 years starting around 540 bc here and um you know it's said that milo to to intimidate his opponents would consume raw bull's meat in front of his adversaries and drink raw bull's blood for energy and vitality so another well picked reference oh. by o'brien here but it sounds like a big psychological burden as well as a big physical burden for poor old calamy right it it is i mean you know he's struggling with this thing and and i think for stephen it's it's an even bigger affront stephen tells martin that it was a bishop's son you know martin being a clergyman it's a bishop's son that first started calamy on it and you know and he's he's kind of watching calamy as a see he falls again how eagerly he takes up his burden they cheer him on the judas ban it's a shame to abuse the poor lad. So the calf has kicked him. He masters the calf. He staggers on. And I'm sorry to say the officers encourage it. Even the captain encourages it. So Stephen's not happy with this at all. Yeah. No, it's, it's kind of a hazing situation, really, what? isn't it? This poor kid is being, being put through this ritual. And presumably, I mean, this is the way all these hazing things work. The captain's looking on, thinking, "Well, yeah, they did similar things to me when I was a squeaker, so you know that can that can pass on down the line." Well, and, and I'm always brought to mind, you know, like the praying mantis and master and commander scene. These things that you know, oh, yeah. you know, Brian doesn't throw these in for no reason here. So I'm kind of wondering: is there somebody else who's kind of laboring on in futility, encouraged against their best interest by other people? You know, who've kind of put them up to yeah. this here. Uh, you know, is this like you say, kind of Stephen versus Jack, the good of the services versus the dignity of man? Um, I don't know. Is it you know, Ooh, they're to a court good, martial, yeah. some kind of thing to keep in mind here as we you know, listen to the cases coming up in the court martial? I don't know. Fascinating uh, story here. Yeah. And again, exactly as you say, Mike, I'm sure it's chosen and and placed just so to keep certain ideas in our heads. Meanwhile, Jack is going to join them on the trip across to the flagship for the court-martial, but he's not quite ready to go. And we have a, f- a, f- a funny scene, and I think a scene that we've seen before. <laughs> Killick's repairing the gold lace on Jack's best hat. Rats, who themselves are going to get eaten by midshipmen in the coming months, have eaten some of Jack's gold lace the prior evening. And even while they're waiting, and Jack's waiting for his hat to get fixed, he he encourages Calamity. <laughs> poor Calamy carrying the calf, to persevere. Now, we should make a list, I think, Mike, of every living thing that has ever gotten after Jack's uniform. We've already had, I think, uh, we've had wombats and we've had sloths. Right, right. This is just the latest in a line of living creatures that's had a bit of a chew on something gold that's meant to go on Jack's uniform. At, at least this time, the rats did not belong to Stephen. But 
<laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, indeed. And the, the rats weren't in a lab experiment, which we've had before as well. No, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. Well, they arrive at the court martial, and Jack is none too pleased when he reads this long list mm. of cases to be considered that day. Um, he understands the first one. They're pretty serious crimes. A captain really can't decide um, because they have serious punishments uh, like death and 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 they're for serious things desertion striking others murder sodomy you know really ambitious theft but there's this long list after that and and this is what i think really puts jack off it's cases of accusations of officers yeah. against other officers for neglect of duty or disobedience disrespect, oppression, tyranny, or scandalous language unbecoming an officer, even drunkenness. And and Jack, you know, kind of mind, I, I think, is enlightened by O'Brien here to us. You know, O'Brien writes, evidence of bad blood and rancor in a service where decent relations were essential to efficiency to say nothing of happiness among the peoples. And we know how important to Jack a happy ship is. Um, and, and Jack yeah. knows, you know, that people, you know, are on a long blockade. They're cut off from contact from home. They, you know, they seem to be forgotten. They have bad supplies. The food's not great. The weather's not great. And and sometimes these small offenses can kind of grow to monstrous proportions. O'Brien tells, us. but still, he really can't believe the length of it. And he realizes that they all come from three ships, primarily the Thunderer which is Hart's flagship, and also the Superb and the Defenders. So you know, it leads Jack to really believe that these things must have been boiling over in bad situations for quite some time, for many, many months. Yeah, and it makes us speculate, I think, what might happen if Jack doesn't take care of the hazing of the midshipmen and S- Stephen Maturin practicing upon and then offending important people like Professor Graham. What might happen if... This guy Summers continues to grow his little clique of, uh, of of privileged lovers in the wardroom. You, you can't say that the Worcester is proof from any of this. You, I think we're being shown that the Worcester could be vulnerable to all these terrible problems, all these social problems, um, if there's not leadership. And we've got to look to Jack and say, is he ready to give the leadership? Yeah, uh, yep. Mike, the, the the other thing I'm noticing is that the 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 episodes of naval history that we're getting from O'Brien so far in the book aren't so much about the Navy going into action. We're getting a lot about the Navy as a society. You know, in the earlier chapter, we had the episode of the depressed men coming aboard and how they're being dealt with. We have here, how is the Navy keeping its own house? How is it managing discipline? It's much more about the Navy as a family and as a community, a community that could be successful and could be at ease with itself, or a community that might actually fall apart under the stress of the service. And that raises the question, how is the Worcester going to fare and how is Jack Aubrey going to fare as its leader? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And we've got, you know, we can kind of harken back to Jeremy saying, you know, that, that O'Brien's kind of this kind of a behavioral analysis lab in full swing here. So, yeah. you know, we'll be waiting for Stephen to be looking at that a little bit and, and even for Jack to be hopefully thinking about that. We know both of them think about this a great yeah. deal. Jack certainly thinks about it as, as they get through the first cases. There have been a number of death sentences, flogging around the fleet with two, three, and 400 lashes, which Jack thinks is you know, essentially a death sentence. And you know, O'Brien tells us that these severe punishments, while Jack always knows they're necessary, you know, kind of plunged Jack's heart in gloom. So you know, Jack's kind of ominous thinking about the problems at home. Now he's thinking about the... the people on the other ships and their conduct with one another and now these heavy sentences. And we kind of hear the first mention, well, I, the Admiral had referred to it earlier, but this last capital case of a clerk accused of comforting the king's enemies. And it's the case which likely prompted, you know, as the Admiral said, the reason he wanted to have this courts martial at sea was to hear this case rather than to have it heard in Malta but now it's announced that the case has been skipped because the clerk, the, the accused clerk, has killed himself. And we have this, I think, deliciously almost dark and sinister description of the the weird situation that this clerk was in and also the really bizarre way in which this man's life might have come to an end. 
anyway, Mike, it, it strikes me that even though this this parade of cases and this really bizarre situation with the with the the clerk has, I feel really prissy saying clerk instead of clerk, but it's how I'm going to say it. Oh, so, no, 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 you I'm not, it's, it's not a, it's not a get at. <laughs> you, you should stick with Anyhow, operation, not my American, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about that either. There's a, a bit of comfort here, although all these cases are really grim, and Jack's seeing the service at his worst. If Jack thinks he's in a bad state, if he's got worries, if his life is a little bit on the rocks, he should check out some of these people. <laughs> you know? Too, he's, too he's, true he's, here. <laughs> Clark had me in, in, in mind of, uh, you know, A Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge and, and talking about keeping in yeah, mind. Right. <laughs> so let's check out these other people. So well, well spotted yeah. Anyhow, Jack sees these secondary cases as a very disagreeable public washing of very dirty linen. And maybe this was what was in Thornton's mind when he said he was happy to see some of these cases being tried um, offshore with the squadron rather than alongside um, Mm. in Malta. Because there were some witnesses that appeared over and over again, either as accuser or as accused, that the court had to fall back on rules of uh, partly proved or just mild reproof for, for petulant behavior or admonishment. There was, however, some some serious jeopardy in the punishments. There was one man who was dismissed his ship, an officer who was broke and dismissed the service. And we hear that the conclusive evidence in a couple of cases came from Admiral Hart, who spoke with evident ill will. And this is, I think known about and reflected upon by Jack Aubrey. But for Nathaniel Martin, who's new to the discipline, who's new to the service, he hears this stuff with real shock. We hear that uh, he watched with a tense, shocked expression on his white face. And Jack reflects, if he, Martin, had ever wanted to see the dirty side of the Navy, he could not have come to a better place. Yeah, yeah. that it, it, You're exactly right, Ian. That, that one last case, too, it's just, you know, two folks drunk on the lower deck saying horrific things to one yeah. another, as we were heard by some people. And then, you know, a murder, right, right in the cot. So Martin, who thought that this was the idyllic life for him, may be having second thoughts at this point here. Well, as all this is taking place, you know, if we kind of roll back the clock a little bit, Stephen has been upstairs talking with Dr. Harrington, the physician of the fleet. And and they're talking at this point now while the early cases are still being heard. So O'Brien's kind of setting us back in time here. And they're kind of discussing the squadron's remarkable good health. And they're speculating on the reasons. They're, they're noting that really um, all the usual Siemens diseases, while there are some causes uh, about them being not on shore very often and some of that stuff, but that overall, they just are amazed at how healthy everybody is, except for three ships. Surprise, surprise, yeah. the Thunderer, Superb, and Defender. And they're the only ships without this general good health, despite having all the other advantages that they discuss here. And Harrington notes that the only difference is their comparative level of happiness is lower. And I love this. Stephen kind of hearkening uh, to you know, sort of psychoimmune. Uh, what is it? Stephen hearkening to an effect that we'll certainly find later. <laughs> Psychoneuroimmunology. Right. There we go. The eff- That's the one. Yeah. Stephen says the effect of the mind on the body is extraordinarily great. I wish I could prescribe happiness. God knows, don't we all wish we could get a dose of that just about now too, right? Yeah. Oh. And I've heard plen- plenty of doctors say exactly the same thing. So science <laughs> and medical science, still still reaching for that one. Can we prescribe There you go. Ones? Right. This is something that hasn't changed over the last couple of decades or, or, or even centuries. You're right. Oh, yeah. well, it's interesting. Harrington replies, I wish that we could prescribe common sense. And then criticizes what he calls the resistance to change in the official mind, the stubborn, dogged clinging to tradition, however evil in semen. And he does add, though, that the Admiral, Admiral Thornton, even though kind of, you know, all the things we know about him, and and he adds a very difficult patient himself, supports him in all his reforms. So, you know, it's this fascinating look into the impact, once again, the behavioral analysis lab. Uh, and its impact on the sailors and the Navy here. Yeah, and we get this deeper analysis of the effect that it's all having on Thornton. Mm. Um, by the way, Mike, I, 
I think you and I have both had a quick look for references to a real Sir John Thornton, and we haven't found one yet. If any of the listeners have found a reference to somebody who was really John Thornton, who was in command of the Mediterranean Squadron, then let us know. But he's also being used as a as a turning point in the story. We're able to point to features and developments of Thornton's character and reflect on them a bit. So Stephen asks how the Admiral is. He's talking to Harrington, who's a physician, clearly. And since the Admiral has consulted Maturin before, Harrington's able to speak freely, and he talks about how impossible, how disobedient and masterful the Admiral is, dosing himself, getting no exercise or sleep, wasting away in body but still sharp in mind. And Harrington says, his task is beyond the powers of a man of his age. It is beyond the powers of a man of any age that is not in perfect health. Can you imagine dealing not only with the management of a large and often troublesome fleet, with Admiral Hart in it, um, but with all the affairs of the Mediterranean as well, the Eastern Mediterranean with its devious, shifting, I'm going to say Byzantine politics. He is at it 14 and 15 hours a day, hardly finding time to eat, still less time to digest. And Harrington goes on and talks about what he as a physician has already tried. He says, my prescriptions, my bark and steel may do some good. But short of going home, there is only one thing that will set him squarely on his feet. What's that? Asks Stephen. Why? An action with the French. A victorious fleet action with the French. I am convinced that if the French were to come out of Toulon and could be brought to action, Sir John would throw off his weakness. He would be happy, vigorous and young. Wow. So now it's time for us to take a short break. We're going to be right back in a few moments. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. You're with Ian and Mike listening to The Lubber's Hole. And and Mike, we're getting all this discussion of Admiral Thornton instead of what we normally get at this point in a story, which is discussion of Jack. Right. And I look at this and I think, yeah, O'Brien is using Admiral Thornton's character and inviting us to have the same reflections about Jack. The wearing melancholy effects of age, the wearing effect of politics and intrigue, although... Jack's only got a small dose of it, but his is at home with his right. family affairs and his um, and his legal affairs and his complicated financial situation. And we get the suggestion with Thornton, as I think we're meant to conclude with Jack, that aging brings with it a diminution of some of the powers, powers of decision, maybe even, hesitate to say the word, maybe even a diminution of courage mm. and that some kind of blazing action is what might be wanted to set things to rights. And I think we see all of those things about Jack. Too true. Absolutely. Well, mm. Harrington knows that Stephen's going to be you know, headed off to see the Admiral, but he, he says, one minute before you go, can I get your opinion on this cadaver, which really puzzles him? Um, and it turns out that this dead man is that Maltese Clark, clerk <laughs> that, <laughs> that we spoke of a minute ago. Yeah, the guy had been a linguist. He was employed by the Admiral's secretary, and the admiral secretary, the guy who is now, by the way, the judge advocate in this court martial, and his job was to translate documents into and back from Arabic for the uh, for the admiral and for the admiral secretary, and he suspected of having made bad use of these documents. Um, Harrington, not at, at this point, is telling Matron that the details probably would have come out at the court martial had this man lived. So the corpse, when they find him, when they, when they go to see him, he's heavily weighted in irons, you know, completely tied down, wrists tied together, ankles tied together. But O'Brien writes, he's arched backwards so that only his head and heels touch the deck. His face set in so agonized a grin that his mouth reached almost to his ears. Now, that Dr. Matron would have said Tacmus, but he notes this rhesus sardonicus, which we'll remember from the last episode was this kind of, you know, comic grin that Stephen would have when these guests were droning on without saying anything. But he's got the real thing here with these muscles stretched up. 
and suggests that it could have been the effect of a poison, as Stephen says, a wild overdose of St. Ignatius beans or a decoction of their principle. Harrington completely agrees, but wonders how the prisoner could have taken this poison while he was completely tied down in irons. So we've got a bit of a mystery here. And and I couldn't help but say, you know, what is St. Ignatius beans? So again, you know, we, we know O'Brien's not too much to be believed as it comes to music, but in all other things. And and lo and behold, yes, you know, St. Ignatius beans contain the poison strychnine and brucine, uh, which affect mm. the transmission of nerve impulses to muscles. Now, I, I was doing this research, but I was a little taken aback to find out that they're also the primary ingredients of two homeopathic remedies. One, Ignatius, Ignatius, Amara, Mm. uh, comes from the seeds of this toxic nut of St. Ignatius' bean tree. And it's used by many people, including me, to treat anxiety. This this works very effective for me. But I'm hoping the the death is the opposite of of anxious. And so if I keep taking these beans, (laughs) I'll no longer be anxious. And interestingly, the other poison in this thing, this brucine, makes nux vomica, which my my horse whispering bride uses to great effect to dose our horses (laughs) and treat their stomach disorders, which for our daughter has treated nausea for years. And I've heard on good authority, but have no experience myself, that it's it's good for hangovers. Gosh, deep. Well, first of all, deep, deep knowledge. That's great. It's a little bit worrying, isn't it? When I suppose it's a feature of homeopathy, isn't it? That what is helpful to us in tiny doses is actually lethal to us in bigger doses. But right, well, maybe exactly. there's a, maybe there's a moral in the story here. Right? We 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 get, we get another little displacement of Jack Aubrey because the next thing that we hear about is. Dr. Maturin being called out to see Admiral Thornton. And yes. Jack's already had his interview with the Admiral, but now Stephen sits with the Admiral and they're going to talk about high naval strategy. I'm reminded of the conversation that we had between Jack and Stephen and Admiral Somarez in the Baltic in the last book. So Stephen is known to Sir John, but back when Sir John was a member of the Admiralty Board, he was a junior lord working with intelligence. Uh, the Admiral knows about Stephen's plans for a rendezvous on the French coast uh, and wishes to go to Barcelona before that. He tells Stephen that he may have to go there on the Thunderer, one of these three ships that are under a bit of a cloud at the moment. And Stephen says, I'd really like to go with Jack in the Worcester, um, since taking Stephen and those he might bring him with him off the coast is likely to be a delicate business. And Stephen describes Jack as a very discreet man. Now, first of all... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny to me that uh, the Admiral says, well, I've never heard Jack Aubrey being called discreet before. And that makes me wonder whether whether Admiral Hart has had his chance to blow a bit of poison in the ear of, uh, of Admiral Thornton. And Stephen corrects himself. He says, at, at sea, at sea. Captain Aubrey is very discreet at sea. And the other comic note here is that, well, Jack sitting in the same chair, talking to the same Admiral just earlier in the same chapter, got bitten in the leg and drew blood. Tabby the pug dog jumps up into Stephen's lap and sits wheezing and gazing admiringly into Stephen's face. So we've got the usual Stephen Maturin effect with animals loving him. But actually, it means that Stephen is in an even more privileged position in an interview with the Admiral than Jack was. And this is not lost on the Admiral either. The Admiral's glad to have Stephen here. He makes the point, as we've already heard, that intelligence is a real mess. He says, I'm at a loss for intelligence. Um, the Admiral Secretary, Mr. Allen, has hired some local talent. They've benefited from Sir Joseph Blaine's colleague, Mr. Waterhouse, until he'd been caught and shot by the French. And Stephen asks if Waterhouse knew that he, Stephen, was coming. And we hear, no, no, the French would have, you know, that, that would have been bad news if the French got to find out in advance where Stephen was. But I think they've avoided that problem. The Admiral said that he only knew a man was coming, not Stephen. He adds that if he... Waterhouse had known that the gentleman was Dr. Maturin. I do not think you need fear any disclosure. Waterhouse was the most secret man I've ever known, although he seemed so open. And Mike, then we get this Italian quote, Volte sciolto, pensieri stretti. I have no idea if my Italian's good there or not. But this seems to be an admiring quote. Where, where does that come from? Well, the the best I could track this down in was letters of the Earl of Chesterfield to his son, where he uses Oh, exactly yeah, him. Oh, yeah, old Chesterfield. Oh, yeah. Chesterfield, late 18th century. Exactly. 
you know, and he, he's telling his son, you know, to have a frank, open and ingenuous exterior with a prudent interior to be upon your guard. And yet by a seemingly natural openness to put people off theirs. Now, I did find one quote even earlier than that that goes back to 1638. Um, Supposedly, Henry Wooten had written this in a letter to John Milton, uh, where he said, you know, he translated it there as, hold your thoughts close and your countenance loose. So again, this idea of seeming very open and, you know, forth and and just quite this great guy, but in fact, completely secretive and interior. So interesting, interesting. And and we're getting this uh, uh, also what I thought was perhaps a little bit naive on the part of the admiral. Even if he knows you're coming, he wouldn't give. Stephen, who's been tortured by the French before, I think probably would suggest otherwise. That So they're still at this big disadvantage, though. Despite this coming together of minds, we hear that the French themselves have got clever people and agents in Constantinople and Egypt and even in Malta, including the ones who've been buying copies of the admiral's papers for months right. from his Maltese clerk, a man that the admiral says will be tried that day it says he is he the admiral is uneasy about the outcome. We cannot ask a gathering of English sea officers to accept raison d'état, reason of state. Yet we cannot hang him without their sentence. On the other hand, we cannot produce the documents, nor can we gag the fellow. How I hope Alan will handle the matter cleverly. He came along surprisingly under Mister Waterhouse's tuition. I'm sure he did," said Stephen. And Mike, I, that, that's quite a deep moment. Yes. The, Clark that Thornton is talking about saying that the the trial is coming on that's the Clark that Stephen examined in this r- rigor pose as a dead body just a few moments ago what's going on there yeah and and you know are we to assume here that in, indeed you know Mr Allen has handled the matter very cleverly by poisoning the Clark have we assumed that maybe he's got one of uh Stephen's kind of you know ampules in his cheek I don't know it, uh, but it does, you know, with this whole thing about being open versus being secretly secretive and conniving inside really a a little bit of a worry here. Yeah. Yeah. I think you and I were talking about that. You had mentioned this little tone of jeopardy here for Stephen as well, right? Yeah. So Stephen's there to conduct his intelligence missions. He's there hoping to go ashore uh, in France and Catalonia, but, but intelligence is a mess. That things have to get handled. I mean, even though this this poisoning or supposed suicide of the clerk was was a and a, a, maybe an adept way of covering up some of the details of the case. Some somebody getting murdered, I think Stephen would say, is a is a botched and messy way of handling something that shouldn't have got this far. So I'm thinking there's danger for Stephen here, and I think we're going to hear more anticipation of danger and jeopardy for Stephen on his intelligence mission as we read on. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, Stephen jumps right back in, picking up with Admiral Thornton here, saying, you know, I understand Mr. Allen is an able, determined man. And, and the Admiral says, you know, absolutely. You know, he's he's done his best against people like the Foreign Office, people from Lord Weymouth's service, the Army, you know, who have been meddling in the affairs of the Mediterranean here. And, you know, in addition to all the councils and people in consulates that are found in each of these countries, each kind of have their own little plots going on, have their own local allies. Um, you know, the the British authorities are doing this. The local authorities are doing this. Everybody's trying to put in a ruler of their own picking. And the admiral says, particularly in the smaller Barbary states, uh, the admiral talking about the English policy says, bless me, you would think we're pursuing half a dozen different policies at once with no central direction or authority. They order these things better in France, Mm. which was kind of an interesting observation given what we just went through with Stephen and the surgeon's mate, right? No, they they don't order things better in France. It's it sounds like a nice way to put a button on the conversation. But Stephen knows that there are silos and there's competition between groups on the intelligence side in France. And this appears, Mike, to be heading in the direction of being another spy thriller and maybe also a bit of a who done it. So we're still looking at some action ashore forthcoming. We'll have to see how it how it rolls out. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, Stephen doesn't share what he knows about the French. He changes the subject to the Admiral's health, and he wants to examine him so he can consult with Dr. Harrington about his care. Um, you know, he waves off the Admiral's reluctance. You know, Admiral's having none of that. Admiral says he's got his own personal remedies, and Stephen puts his foot down. He says, the health of the Commander-in-Chief is of great concern to the entire fleet, to the entire nation. Nor is it to be left in unqualified hands. Let us hear no more of Mungo's cordial. <laughs> um, now, Stephen cannot find a peccant organ. Uh, it's he, Stephen reports. Now, interestingly, that's what Dr. Harrington asked Stephen to look for on the corpse of the deceased Clark. So, uh, again, you know, Ooh. Brian throws these little terms that he pulls back later. And I'm wondering, oh, I'm not sure exactly what that suggests. But Stephen does agree with everything we've heard so far, and he suggests to the Admiral that he thinks the cure for the Admiral's disease is the French. Yes, I think, and in particular, action against the French. Not, yes. <laughs> not their diet or their culture, but fighting them. I think the Admiral asks Stephen if there's a chance they'll come out in the next two to three months and Stephen says, well, that, that two to three month time horizon is quite well chosen. The Admiral thinks that there is. He says that uh, any time that the uh, the blockade's blown off station, the French can spot the British positions from land, easily escape them. Two ships got out last month. He hopes their whole fleet doesn't get out. It could turn the war. So time is working against the English and their worn out ships. The weather might um, help the French. The French, in any case, will be able to wait until the weather defeats the English, and then they can perhaps come out at their leisure. And Mike, this is really fascinating. We've got Stephen talking about high naval strategy, as we said before, with the Admiral. Why isn't Jack Aubrey in this conversation? We've got to do something, I think, to boost the fortunes and boost the spirits of Jack Aubrey. Absolutely. Well, they're, they're sitting there waiting for the results of the courts martial to come back in for Mr. Allen to reappear. And the Admiral has got this huge stack of correspondence and he's trying to deal, finding his spectacles. And he asks Stephen to start reading them to him, you know, which is, you know, you've, you've pointed out before, this is kind of an interesting thing that O'Brien does. Part of that change of perspective, part of that different way of doing exposition, part of that way of sometimes giving us little clues that we need to be paying attention to. We're getting this idea that I, I think O'Brien esteems letter writing. You know, we we I think we've read about that a little bit in in terms of how he ran his life. He esteems the writing of a good letter, and I think he likes to give this context of letter writing to his characters, so they can have all this fun with exposition and humor and uh, and context. Right. Well, tell us what is he what does he read about here? Ah, so. He's asked Stephen to read letters, and the first one that we turn to is from the Pasha of Egypt, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Pasha of Egypt being somebody who's in the Ottoman Empire, you know, not the Sultan, but the person who's ruling um, Egypt in the place of the Sultan. So the Pasha of Egypt writes a long, fawning letter with many, many flowery uh, words of praise towards the Admiral. Thanks the Admiral for writing in Arabic. But the Admiral says he never really addressed the real point of the communication. Stephen, I think, was surprised to hear that the Admiral had written in Arabic and he believes that official letters go out in English. But when the Admiral wants to get things done, he uses a translator to write in local language. And that's, what he says, what led to the trouble with the clerk who's on trial. They need a really good Turkish translator. And Mike, I think that's a spot that might be getting kept open for our Professor Graham. If only he, If only we can get him back. And if only right. Stephen's sarcasm doesn't put him off. Right. So the next letter is this, the Pasha of Barca. So yet another person here under the Ottoman Empire. And he is the new Pasha. This new one, Mohammed, writes and asks that the Admiral send someone to congratulate him. The Admiral says that Mohammed had asked for their help overthrowing his brother. But the Admiral knew from intercepted letters that Mohammed, the new Pasha, is really allied with France. And his brother, Jafar, was actually a better friend to England. Now, he thinks that the French ships that just recently got out when the ships were blown off blockade are probably on their way there or may be there now. And he's hoping that he can provoke them into breaching the country's neutrality. If, he, if they do so, if they fire on an English ship there in that port, 
then the admiral can say, you know, start an action and restore the brother Jafar. But as long as the country's neutral, he can't do it. So anyhow, we've got a, uh, next we've got a letter from the Emperor of Morocco, and again, I think part of the uh, the Ottoman Empire, um, assuring Admiral Thornton of their support and the long-standing friendship between their nations. The Emperor of Morocco promises to resupply their ships, and the Admiral says, well, this is vital. We really need this. Luckily, unlike the bays and pastures of the Adriatic of the East, this particular person, the Emperor of Morocco, can be depended upon. Now, Alan comes in as well. He reports on the outcome of the court-martial and tells the Admiral, good news, I guess, that it was not necessary to try the Maltese clerk because he appeared to have poisoned himself. Poisoned himself, cries the Admiral, fixing Alan with a stern, penetrating look. And then the life fades. He muttered, what does one man matter after all? I'm like, this is a really sort of downbeat moment. It sounds like the Admiral at first doesn't buy it and he wants to engage and grapple with it and figure out what's really going on. But he decided that he's just too tired. He can't get his teeth around this and he's just going to press on and, and, and leave the matter. Yeah, yeah. It really, it, it makes you wonder what's what's going on here. And you, you, know, you mentioned earlier, this is, boy, this is quite the situation that Stephen's stepping into in the middle of this whole political uh mess over here. Well, meanwhile, we've got uh, Mr. Martin. And so Mr. Martin now having been to the court martial, you know, kind of his the last remaining clergy on the Worcester, he decides to go spend the night with the two of the condemned men aboard the Defender. And he returns to the Worcester early in the morning and he's, he's really shaken. He watches as they're hanged. He watches as the people yeah are flogged around the fleet, you know, stopping at each ship to receive their lashes. And he, he's talking to Stephen saying he just can't take it anymore. Uh, and Stephen says, you know, there probably won't be much more of it, that there's a surgeon that the fleet sends along. He's in a boat behind this this man that's being flogged. And and Matron says, if he has any bowels, um, he's going to stop this thing. And uh, Martin uh, you know, says that he doesn't believe there are any bowels at all in the service, what he calls this barber service. And he hopes to God that God will send a hurricane to stop all of this. And, you know, O'Brien kind of leaves us there in the middle of a, a bit, another bit of an ominous chapter break here. Yeah. Not sure about foreshadowing or wishing for a hurricane. We'll have to, we'll have to have words, I think, with the Reverend Martin. <laughs> Yeah, we did. We didn't like that too much with the pilot pellworm. <laughs> Recently. No, we didn't. We really didn't. Right. So it's time for the Worcester's next stage in their voyage to to get attached to the to the squadron. They sail to join the inshore squadron. Um, this is the squadron that's maintaining a close blockade over Toulon. Is probably you know, maintaining a, a watch over the harbour every day if they can. The squadron reports that more and more ships appear to be ready to leave, that two ships have slipped out in the storm. One of them was a 74 and one of them was a heavy frigate. And that, we learn, left the Admiral, the French Admiral, with 26 sail of the line to Admiral Thornton's 13 plus whatever frigates happened to be about. So if the fleet come out and an action is joined, the odds are significantly tilted in the favour of the French with all of these heavy, well-prepared ships alongside in the harbour of Toulon. And Mike, we hear a bit more about blockade service. We hear that blockade cruising is a bit of a dress parade. We're expected to sail precisely on station. We're expected to maintain really high standards of seamanship and beauty and prettification of ships watchful eyes all of the time from the admiral with no room for error and jack and tom as captain and first lieutenant were pretty pleased with their crew except that i think some of the midshipmen have started to fall under the spell of right. this uh snobbish guy lieutenant summers they these midshipmen have become fervent admirers of summers and jack meanwhile is settling into life on blockade and worried more and more i think about legal problems at home yeah well, that particular day, Jack is setting those worries aside momentarily. He's all dressed up to go dine with Admiral Mitchell, that you know, the leader of the inshore fleet. And he knows that Mitchell has this habit. Mitchell used to be a topman uh, and is this huge, you know, strong forearms. And there's going to be this customary race to the crossjack trees before dinner. 
And Jack had had a little conversation with Stephen about this earlier. He was Jack was <laughs> pleased that he lost a little weight and that he had dressed with two pairs of old socks. That, and, it, you know, we're kind of wondering, what's he talking about? And it's to help him in this race up to the tops and back down with the Admiral. Interestingly, the way it helps him is that Jack is winning the race. And as they're sliding down to the deck, Jack knows that he has to break really hard or he'll beat the Admiral, which is, you know, unforgivable. So, you know, <laughs> he's, he's acquitted himself extremely well. He breaks. He's tearing the skin off his hands. He's tearing up these socks on his feet. And he allows the Admiral to beat him by, in the Admiral's words, half a nose. Well, the, the bet had been for a dozen bottles of champagne. The Admiral knows Jack doesn't have that. So he lends him his. And, uh, you know, it, it, it says, you know, you can pay me later. And they drink them all at dinner. They're eating with uh, six other men there in the Admiral's company. They're drinking loads and loads. At the end of the evening, Jack's kind of pushed to share a witticism. And Stephen, Stephen turns out to be an asset for Jack yet once again. Jack saying, well, you know, I'm not much of a wit myself, but my surgeon, Dr. Matron, and he tells Stephen's joke about the dog watches being curtailed. And I think everybody had, you know, kind of knew Jack before, was, uh, you know, ready for some Aubreyisms and not too much, but they love this. It's a huge hit. So everybody is toasting Stephen. They're, you know, the Admiral retells the curtailed joke three times. And Jack is completely in his cups returning to the ship. Bonden had already told the gig crew that they won't be returning in the usual manner, that it'll be the, the gallery ladder rather than being piped aboard. Uh, he knows that Jack, in his drunken state, <laughs> will not want to be parading in front of the people who would probably several of them be flogged for drunkenness tomorrow. And and interestingly, we find out, you know, in this story here that, uh, and you've done a little research, that Mitchell's a real person. And, and we're going to learn a little bit more about Mitchell here later. Yeah, he was. So um, the real Sir William Mitchell, born 1745, so already an old man by the time of this this moment in the uh, in the timeline, was indeed... An admiral of the uh, of the British Royal Navy, uh, he was eventually knighted. He was first recorded as having joined the navy in 1766 as an able seaman, and died in 1816 as a vice admiral. That's what it says in Wikipedia. So he's one of these aft through the horsehole types. He served before the mast. He became uh, a warrant officer. He became a master's mate. He was made a lieutenant. Um, he went before a Navy board and was promoted in 1781 and then had a series of roles, first as flag captain and then as an admiral. And there is this interesting story about where um, where he might have ended up and part of his record is a little bit obscure. So we might come back to that in a second. But Thornton, can't find any sign of him. William Mitchell, absolutely a real person. And I think O'Brien's got a bit of admiration for William Mitchell. O'Brien's yep. got a bit of a thing about social mobility and egalitarianism. And I think he's really pleased that the person who gets to drink champagne with Jack Aubrey and tease him and help to rehabilitate him a bit is a former foremast Jack himself. Yeah, I love that. I do love that. We take a, a quick interlude before we come back to Mitchell. And it's the next morning, the next day. And Jack is pretty hungover. But he's, you know, he's being Jack. He's being the captain. He's not letting anybody in on this. And he and Tom Pullings, it turns out, have devised this new way to practice the great guns uh, while in the middle of this blockading squadron so that they, you know, want to do this without firing on other ships. And I I won't go into the the details there. Somehow they use netting and lays and everything. So I guess they could tell where the gun would be fired to. Fascinating thing. But it, as they're doing this, you know, there's, uh, O'Brien tells us that they're still using Jack's private gunpowder, which has absolutely excited the squadron. There's these laborious signals about Guy Fawkes and was the Worcester in serious distress. And so, you know, we, we were hearing about all this, but Poolings that day looks at Jack and says, you know, perhaps we might dispense with practice this evening. You know, he sees Jack's hangover, but Jack insists, of course not. You know, what would make you think that? 
And sure enough, they load the things up and the first one goes off and there's this brilliant white flash and O'Brien writes an extraordinarily loud, high-pitched bang. Jack winces, is about to throw his hands up to cover his ears and his aching head, but instead reaches behind him, grasps hard, his, his, his hands hard behind him, but it's these rope burned hands. So he's just really irritating these burns as he's going through the entire gunnery drill here uh, so that he wouldn't cover his ears. And he's kind of cursing himself for ever letting this practice go on. He returns to his room and he still doesn't want to admit anything's going on. There's black coffee waiting. You know, he's saying to Killick, what in the world would make you think I need coffee at this time of night? And Killick, you know, which it's because the doctor's coming to examine your hand. So it's, you know, it's sort of a delightful little aside here to see Jack continuing to kind of fall down the ladder a little bit, even though he's won the race, the ropes in the top, but that all of his friends are looking out for him in spite of Jack. He's he is a lucky guy. This is a new kind of well, not new kind. This is a special version of lucky Jack Aubrey. Right. He's lucky in his choice of friends. So good for Jack. Yeah. Over coffee, Jack gets to tell Stephen that Martin is maybe laying it on. He says he's carrying on too much about the harshness of the Navy and about his reaction to the flogging around the fleet. Jack says about M- Martin, I must confess that a flogging around the fleet is not a pretty sight. I feel that perhaps he, Martin, may carry it a trifle high. He may exaggerate. It's unpleasant to be sure, but it is not necessarily death and damnation. Well, Stephen's not entirely sure about this, and he decides to to push Jack a little bit further. A little bit of needle going on here. For my part, I should prefer hanging, said Stephen. You and Martin, says Jack, may say what you like, but there are two ends to every pudding. Stephen hears this Aubreyism, and he goes for the juggler. He decides he's going to rinse Jack with a bit of proper Stephen sarcasm. Well, two ends to every pudding. I should be the last to deny it, said Stephen, if a pudding starts clearly it must end the human mind is incapable of grasping infinity and an endless pudding passes our conception (laughs) well done Stephen. so i think jack then decides that that this is all too much airy fairy philosophical talk he's a bit overmatched so he decides to bring Stephen back down to earth yeah he says for example jack says i dine today with a man who is flogged round the fleet and yet he flies his flag Stephen says admiral mitchell You astonish me. I am amazed. It is rare, perhaps all too rare, that an admiral is flogged round the fleet. I cannot recall an instance of it in all my time at sea, though the dear knows I have seen a terrible lot of punishment. And Jack goes on to tell the story of Mitchell. Um, And Mike, I'm pretty sure, at least I'm as sure as Wikipedia can be, that this is an authentic or, or at least authentically believed bit of the real story of the real Sir William Mitchell. Jack says that Mitchell was a press man. He had deserted from time to time to see his girl. This had happened once too often. He'd refused punishment once and had been made an example of and received 500 lashes. He survived the Yellow Jack when his ship was ordered to the Spanish main. Um, The new captain then in this situation with half of her people died, uh, the new captain made him a midshipman and Mitchell was passed as a lieutenant and was acting second when they took a French ship. And of course, we know that actions that involve taking an enemy ship, especially when the captain dies, um, are great for the officers who then get their step. So Mitchell got his step and a sloop and more postings, more successful actions, and he's made post and now he's hoisted his flag. And Jack points out, as many people have said in their turn about Jack himself, that it's all luck and a doubt of being a good seaman. And Mike, it's striking that lots and lots of this story is believed to be true also about William Mitchell. Right. Not necessarily that he was flogged around the fleet, but there, we do believe that there's a gap in the service record of Mitchell that would be about right for somebody whose record has been a little bit kept on the down low because he's been involved in some some misconduct and he's been punished. Yeah, fascinating. I, and I love here that Jack points out, as you say, that, that it's all – luck and and we've heard jack say that before that the reason you know i where i am is because i've been lucky other people better than me didn't have that luck but now jack's thinking about the luck a little bit differently yeah and he says luck was not kind to mitchell early on but made it up to him later 
and and then O'Brien writes up in Jack's mouth. I had amazing good luck when I was young, taking the Caca Fuego and the Fanchula and marrying Sophie to say nothing of prizes. And sometimes I wonder. Mitchell began by being flogged round the fleet. Perhaps that is how I shall end. Whoa. Oh, Mike. Ouch. So we've had foreshadowing references to, to storms. We've had references to the worn out fleet. We've had references to worn out senior officers. The weather is perhaps the thing that might allow the superior French squadron to succeed. The odds are stacked against Jack. He's on a, on a ship that's not in great shape. He's got his legal struggles. And now he himself is doubting his own luck. Perhaps he says, that's how I shall end. Yeah. So Mike, this raises some really great questions about what's going to happen in the rest of the book. We believe that there's a the potential for lots of espionage and lots of foul play, shifting political sands. And for Jack as well, there's some jeopardy in just how is his naval conduct going to work out? Is he going to be doomed to stay on station with the inshore squadron doing blockade duty? Or is he going to get the chance to explore a little bit and play the frigate captain again, escorting Stephen on his missions ashore? Ooh, wouldn't that be sweet? Wouldn't that be sweet? Well, we know something's got to happen quickly. You know, Stephen's kind of inferred that the Admiral has perhaps two to three months left in him. And we're kind of getting the feel that the Worcester might not have that much time herself. So what do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, Mike, with all my heart. We saw the new wardrobe. The new wardrobe? <laughs> I don't want to see inside that wardrobe. <laughs> right. <laughs>